Hi, I'm Joel Bloom, president of New Jersey Institute of Technology. At NGIT, we believe that not only our students, but all citizens need to be informed about the issues facing higher education. As New Jersey Science and Technology University, NGIT is proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. United Water, making the planet sustainable is the best job on Earth. Meridian Health, Cone Resnick, Accounting, Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. Fedway Associates, The Fidelco Group, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in Lincoln Center. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Kelly Ford, who is the midday personality on New York's Nash FM 94.7 and the host of Nash Matters. You are it in New York City when it comes to country music. Well, we are the only country station in New York. Because? Uh, I don't know. That's always perplexed me. I, I, can't, I was in radio in Denver, came here to do Nash, and I remember coming to the CMA broadcasts in 2004. And here's, you're hosting the city that's hosting. Yeah. And all the talk of the town was, why don't they have a country station? I haven't had one since around 1996. Right. W-Y-N-Y, -Y, I think. And uh, it's been fun to be part of, of finally kind of getting beleaguered New York country fans, <clears throat> kind of a, a, a place to come together and call their own. What's I mean, the market? Uh, Describe the market, the country music market here. It's very diverse, actually. I, I, I'm on the air every day from 10 to 3, as you said, and I'm getting winners of, I, I think it's the most diverse age-wise format. So I'm getting moms calling saying, oh, I'm going to take my daughter, and daughters calling saying, I'm going to take my mom. I think it's that format now. Like when we were growing up, how I'm assuming we're both in our 30s. 30s. Mm -hmm. That you know that kind of when when everything kind of was on one station, and I think uh, country is is that format that brings people together right now because it tells stories. It's the one format that you know is so compelling because it's 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 storytelling at its best. 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., five hours. Yes. Easy. Uh, I worked mornings for 20 years, which makes me oh I shouldn't have said. 27. I, thank so, you. Um, I need to do the math on that. So, so let me ask you this. No, I love it. Does it go it. by quickly? It does because we have so much to do. We're also, it's a lot dealing with clients during the day that, you know, other day parts don't actually deal with the sales department. And you, You're involved in that. Yeah. You're involved in the business. We, we are. We do commercials. You know, I, I endorse products. We, yeah, it's, it's commercial radio. You're all in. We, we, it's I, like public television. We don't do commercials and we don't do spots, but we are all in and raising the money. It's funny. If you don't do the business, there's no product. Like, you can't do this. I think sometimes people forget that when you're delivering the product that they want. And, and sometimes, you know, you, you, you wouldn't go into a pizza hut and ask for a hamburger. We, we, what we have here are pizzas, mm. and that's what country music, I, I'm, not, I'm not compared country music to pizza. No, point well taken. You, and my notes say, and they could be wrong, that you did not grow up loving country music. Well, I grew up in the South, I grew up in Kentucky, and I think particularly in my era, you either grew up loving country music or you grew up hating country music. And for me back then, it was my parents' music. I mean, in the South, country's also, just the constant soundtrack. So I was, I was a little rebellious, Steve. But I like really... Springsteen. Oh, well, who, well, well, and I like from, the Clash. I'm from Jersey, so <laughs> we had to love Springsteen. I'm Maybe I'm a for. punk time. So. It was punk time, a so you bit. loved, okay, the Clash, okay, okay. not my thing. But um, how about this? When did you know you loved country? I, when I got the job in country. 
I got a job in country radio. And I happened to get a job in, I was, I'm a radio broadcaster. So I was, and I was a newscaster actually. So I got a so job news doing news thing. in the mornings in Denver. And it happened to be the exact same year that Garth hit the scene. So Garth, Garth Brooks blows up, crazy. big. He, he was really, it, it's funny now, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, country's too pop. I was there when Garth came out, and people were saying Garth was too pop. That's interesting. They were saying Garth wasn't country. So it has definitely evolved over the years and the, changed. The hottest, is, I was just asking, our producer just said in my ear, Carrie Underwood, I was just about to say, before you said it, by the way, <laughs> Carrie Underwood. He knows. No, I was thinking, Carrie Underwood. Yes. Is she it? Uh, she is one of our top females. She definitely is. She's got it all, and she does it with grace and poise. And, and I think... You know, I think Miranda Lambert would also be right up there with her right now. I don't know her. She's married to Blake Shelton. I'm sure she okay, would yes, to I got, identify uh, her like that. I, I know, I got that. I got, that. I got the Blake Shelton. Him, okay. Mr. Miranda Lambert. And what about They're Taylor both, Swift? Is she country? She has she has taken herself out of country right now. She was look you know, at this. Key, to, look how beautiful she is. You know how beautiful you are. That was at MetLife. That was at MetLife her, uh, two summers ago. Sold sure. it out, killed it. What What's the story with her? Real talented? I, I will say this. I adore her. I think she's fought very hard. She's, you know, she's polarizing. People love her or they don't like her for whatever reason. Mm. I think there's some, I think there's some sexist reasons behind that in a lot of ways. But I feel like she is genuine. She's worked hard. She's an amazing songwriter. She's had a vision. It's been really great. I have a daughter, so it's been great to see her evolve and kind of take some risks. And what do you mean she's sorry for What do you mean she took herself out of country? She, she is in pop now. She actually she, you took your, you'd say I'm she out. She said I'm, I'm now out. going to make a pop album. She she made that clear. And that, that was okay. widely publicized in Rolling Stone. She said, I'm now I'm moving more toward pop. As she evolved and got older, and I believe, you know, Nashville loves her. She, she gave $6 million to the Country Music Hall of Fame to renovate it. Mm. Her home is Nashville. I believe that she will come back to country someday. What is Nash Matters? Nash Matters is the public affairs show we do on Nash Up. Public affairs. Describe yes. it. Uh, we really feature nonprofits in the New York tri-state area, and it's our opportunity as a station to connect with listeners and to let them know, because there hadn't been a country station here for so long, that we're here. We're a part of the fabric, and we're not going anywhere. And we want to help them in any way we can. Misconceptions about country music and those who love country music? Uh, I, I don't know about misconceptions. I do know I, yeah, that everybody, I guess I do. I mean, the, the, the misconceptions everybody has, like that everybody's got a piece of hay in their t I'm from Kentucky. Is that old? So I've heard them all. I have shoes on today, so I, I, See? Thank so you. I do wear shoes. I think that, you know, that it's just one, one country. I think country is a way of life. And I a think way of you, life. I mean this, you're in the city, you love the outdoors. You, you probably, at your young age of 30, long for simplicity. I think it's about simple storytelling, and I think that's universal. So I think to say only, you go to, Farnborough was just recently mm. on Randall's Island, and I would challenge anybody to go to a country concert to, to watch the people there, to see who they are, and they're your wife, and they're your sister, and they're your brother-in-law. It's, it's really a great cross-section of our country. And if you don't like country, to go to a concert, I, I'd be hard-pressed if you said you didn't love it. They, they, there's so much energy, it, 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 it would make you a fan. So. Well, you, you, I have a feeling you just made a lot of people on public television a fan yes. to be open-minded to country music. And people can check you out on uh, a Nash FM 94.7, every day from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., five hours of great radio. Kelly Ford, appreciate you joining us here on public television, also the host of uh, Nash Matters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato.
We are pleased to welcome Mr. Ruben Santiago Hudson, who is an actor, director, writer, and uh, I'm going to be talking about your new series on TNT called Public Morals. What's it all about? It's the Public Morals Division of the New York Police Department in 1968. So how much fun can you have? I mm. mean, it's all the decadence in the world was going on in, in <laughs> Times Square, and, and we're there to police each other and to police the bad guys. Yeah, premiering in August. By the way, we're taping in uh, late June, premiering in August on TNT. Yes. Um, we were just talking about this before we got on the air. Uh, you grew up in where, Lackawanna? Lackawanna, New York, next to Buffalo. Describe it for folks who don't know that part of the state of New York. It's a steel, it's a steel town. It's, uh, <clears throat> I was surrounded on three sides by steel mills, and the other side was a highway headed, headed out. So it was a great time and a great place to grow up. A lot of snow in the winter. You know, the blizzard of 77 and all that took place while I was growing up. So, you know, 10, 8, 6 feet of snow all the time. So we had a great time, great summers. Uh, neighborhood families, people took care of each other. And that's what the movie Like Wanna Blues was about, people taking care of each other. Yeah, it's funny because uh, you're in Selma, American Gangster, many, many other uh, films that are very well known. But you said to me, I'm really proud of Lackawanna Blues. Yes. Talk about that. I'm so proud of Lackawanna Blues because it's a universal story in a sense. It's about community and about the elders of the community taking responsibility to every, for everyone in that community. And my mother was the queen of that community as far as generosity. She took everything and everybody that came to her door. Why? Because, I don't know, I think it's a strange relationship between certain people on this earth and, and the creator, and that's their job. Uh, just like you and I do ours. I think that was my mother's job. And, and the mystery of that is what made me write that movie, to say thank you and, and try, to, try to share that love with, with everybody. What did she teach you? She taught me, first of all, uh, respect. She taught me responsibility, uh, humility. Uh, she also taught me to have a good time and to work hard. Mm. When did you know? that being an artist, because you do so many different things, that being an artist had to be your professional life? Well, it, I knew that it had to be my professional life when it wouldn't let me go. No matter what else I tried to do, the arts kept calling me back. And what, when it became very solid when I found out how effective I could be as a human being and make a difference in the world through this art that I had a voice and that people were listening and that I only, uh, didn't only use it for entertainment, I used it for enlightenment. And so if I can change things for the better, just a little bit, mm. by bringing you with me for a couple hours on stage or in a film or on TV, then I think my living is, is, is worthy. Was there a particular time early on when a certain play, a certain performance, where you knew how powerful that could be? Something stand out? Yes. Uh, the first time that I found out the real full impact of, uh, of theater was Sizwe Bonzi is Dead by uh, Ethel Fugard. When I did that play, I mean, left people crying and it left people laughing and it made people want to have a dialogue about life and humanity. And the premise was? It's a, it's a, a gentleman, you know, in South Africa, and, you know, he's trying to go to a different province to have a better life, but he can't move. During apartheid. the government, yes. And so a buddy tries to help him get another identity so he could better self-serve his community and his family. It's interesting. You, you consider yourself a political person? I think everything is political. I don't think everything is political. Everything is political somehow Art. or another. Art is definitely political. It has to reflect the times. It has to have some impact and emotion and, and intellectual base that's just delved deeply into what's going on in, in our world today. So if someone says, it's interesting because you're talking about the, the new series on TNT, you mm -hmm. go back and say 1968 Times Square, this is pre, let's just say Disney Times Square, a different Times Square. Different. Much different, different, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, if someone says, well, art is designed mostly to divert our attention from reality and give us a chance to escape, you say? I don't agree. Art is a reality magnified. So it, it'll, it'll take a magnifying glass and put it on certain parts of, of life, whether it's, whether it's uh, relationships, whether it's uh, racism, whether it's love, whether it's uh, familiarity, pathos. It shines the light on the things that, that make us really human. As a director, your blues ain't sweet like, like mine. mine. Your Talk Blues Ain't it. Sweet Like Mine is the, my latest play. I, uh, we just had a wonderful uh, uh, run in a world premiere at Two River Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey. They have been tremendously supportive. It's a great arts community. People don't realize that. It's a great, but that theater 
now has Great put theater. a foundation in that community that will last forever under the leadership of John Diaz, Michael Hurst, uh, Stephanie Cohen. Uh, I, that play I've been writing for 14 years. It had been rejected at more places than I could even name. And John Diaz and that group there said, we want to, to do this play it's because... It's about race. It's about race. It's about, just give us it's a also about short love. version. Race and love. Uh, people come together in a dinner party where a lot, of, a lot of these kind of plays are set. And what happens is they start voicing their opinions, not knowing how subconsciously racist those opinions are. And what it does is it changes each individual when they hear not that c coming out of their own mouths and accepting it from somebody else's mouth. But it makes us try to understand what America is about, where it's been, and where it needs to go. So given we're doing this program in late June of 2015, post-Baltimore, post-Ferguson, post-Staten Island, post so many situations across post the country. Post-Charleston. Thank you. Unfortunately, nine lives tragically lost, um, senselessly lost. You want to bring this play to Broadway? No, now, not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, it's, it's, I don't, you know, it would be great if somebody was to come and say, you know, consider Broadway. I want to get it to as many people as possible. Broadway, However. Broadway is sometimes really short-lived because it's about finance. It's not about enlightenment. It's about what is a hit and what will run. Off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway is about humanity and changing things and discovery and exploring and getting larger and creating new things and new ways to do things, having conversations that aren't always cushy and fun and comfortable. Off-Broadway, we do that. On Broadway, rarely do you go someplace, especially African-Americans, and make you uncomfortable. So it's interesting. My note said that you want to, quote, take this to Broadway. That's just not to New York. That's not my quote. Is New York, well, let me ask you this. New York is not necessarily Broadway to you. No, New York, uh, Broadway is a very small segment of it. It's a very powerful, very powerful segment of it. But the theater is way bigger than, uh, than, than Broadway. I, I look to bring it probably, I have some wonderful producers with me on it now, and they believe in it, and they, and they, they want to finance it. So it probably will end up in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Yeah, which is it's a great arts community out there, and they're hungry for this kind of work. They're hungry to elevate all the art that they do in Brooklyn, as well as in the Bronx and Queens as well. Because Manhattan is the, be the beacon of it, and they want to compete. Let me ask you this. This conversation is always important, timely, even if it makes people uncomfortable, but now more than ever? Now more than ever, because it's, it's now the things that happen in our country that are unsurly, that are heinous, they, they get distributed to the mass as far as we get to see it now because of mass media, social media, mm. and the, the, the phones with the, with the, with the pictures and, and with the video. We get to witness, we don't hear or read in the paper, we see. Now we don't see the whole situation, but we see enough of it to know yeah, that's not say, right. Enough. When, 11, when a 12-year-old boy gets shot within five seconds by a police officer. And then drive we, by, literally we, just driving by. When a police car to... pulls up on the sidewalk with the grass in front of anybody, you're afraid because they're not coming in to squelch anything. They're coming in in a forceful way. And this little boy didn't know how dangerous that 12 was. 12 years old. Nobody talks about that. They t we talk about the people who they can find a record on. Mm. We don't talk about a 12-year-old boy that has no record or these people in, the, in uh, Charleston right now. Ruben Santiago Hudson, it says you're an actor, you're a director and a writer, but you're more than that. You're uh, someone who's uh, saying things and doing things that cause us to think about ourselves and the society we live in and how to make things better. That's even more important. So I want to thank you and wish you all the best also with Public Morals, uh, new series on TNT. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored in public television to have Mary Lynn Henry the author of How to Be a Working Actor, and who you have so many other credits, I'm not even gonna go through them here. Uh, when did you know that you loved acting? I think I was five. How did you know you loved I acting? I think because there is something in children that lets them be very happy or inspires them to entertain their parents. So I was kind of an extroverted child 
I think, though, it wasn't till I was 10 that I was serious. And that was because the nun in fifth grade cast me as the part of woman one in a sketch about Our Lady of Fatima. That'll do it. And there was no going back. <laughs> no. OK, all right, ready? Let's get right into it. The three best tips for how to be a working actor. I think the first thing I'm going to start with is really being honest, being earnest, that this is a lifetime occupation, not a part-time hobby. So you put your whole self into the process, if this is what you want, of preparing for this event. And that doesn't mean getting off a bus at Port Authority. That means training. Mm. That means having experience. A lot of actors, I will say, when did you decide to become an actor and why? And usually it's because their mother took them to see Annie <laughs> or some other great musical. Right. And they knew they had to get up on that stage. That's the urge to perform, to entertain, to love it. Um, and, and that's the first thing I would say. You have to have that. You've got to have it. And then, please don't let expectations get in the way of your goal. A lot of people get out of training schools, conservatories, drama programs, and they think, OK, now I've trained. I have a degree. I should be getting a job. I should be. Exactly. I'm entitled. Wrong. No one's entitled to a job in this business because you have to earn it. And so it may take a few years, a few months. It's, there's no time limit on mm. this career. A lot of people try to put a time. If I don't make it in five years, I'm out of here. Wrong thinking. Turn it around. See what you can do in the meantime while you're not getting an audition every day to work creatively for yourself because you're your own business person. Say that part again. You're your own business person. You're your own business person. This is your business. Time out. Someone says, I have an agent. That agent is supposed to be getting me these gigs. Yeah, right. It's not my job to be promoting myself. Let me put it this way. The agent gets 10%. The actor works 90% to get that agent 10%. <laughs> In fact, it's 110%. You I have to you. go beyond the agent. Agents work for you as long as you're making it, as long as the auditions are saying, OK, he's got callbacks, he's got a, a third callback for a Broadway show, he's got a role on an episodic television program, so he's hot. But sometimes the heat stops. Mm. And then what do you do then? Agents don't have to take you for life. It's usually in a contract situation, 90 days trial period. Right. So. It's interesting, because I've always had the same philosophy. You are your own best promoter. And people you say, oh, you're a self-promoter. I'm thinking, really? That's a criticism? That's never a criticism. As I said, and I tell this to the students when I do seminars, I've done seminars for years. It's in the book. In order to survive in this business, you have to promote yourself. Mm -hmm. Most com I'm sorry for interrupting, no. which is, I'm sure, a bad thing. Um, most common mistakes people make? Doing nothing. What does that mean? Well, doing nothing means you're not doing anything towards getting a job in the business. So a lot of people, and this is unfortunately what's happening today in the industry, will go to an actor's equity open call at 3 AM in the morning. They'll start the line. The call doesn't start until at least 9 a.m. So already they've invested their whole day practically in waiting to get a number to be seen by a casting director for whatever the parts are available in that play. Mm. A lot of people cannot do that. They give up, they go home, they make breakfast. What's important here is that you never lose sight of your focus. Focus is key and discipline. Focus, discipline, progress being smart about yourself as a business person. And for years, there's been this horrible thing going on with actors. I'm an artist. I'm not a businessman. You have to be both. As if they're tainted by being a business person. Oh, business has, a, has kind of a very serious left brain connotation. Mm. It goes against the grain of the creative artist. But how would you ever sell a painting unless you got it down on the street? <laughs> Let me ask you, any difference for men and women being a working, working actor? Well, here's the problem, and this is why 
uh, I'm a member of the, the League of Professional Theater Women, which is trying to get more opportunities for women in theater in all fields of theater, from designers to directors to actors and so forth. And we find that there is not complete gender parity here, that a lot of the plays are male-centric. Right. So there are fewer women's roles. There are fewer women directors who are directing plays, although they're, they're, the numbers are rising, we're happy to say. And so that, for the most part, we see on series and in film a majority of masculinity involved, and maybe one girl who's the lead. And that's been going on for a long time. Getting any better? I think it is. I think I see signs of improvement here. And as long as there are women writers out there to write more roles for women because they have the connection immediately and more males who will give more chances to women, we might have a win-win by 2020 because we're, <laughs> we're going 50-50 in 2020. That's one of our advocacy objectives. Yeah, a few seconds left. You love what you do. I love what I do, and I love theater history, which is why I'm a theater historian, and I bring that. And in the future, I hope to write a book called Career Intelligence for the Actor. When you do that, will you come back? I definitely will. The name of the book is How to Be a Working Actor, written by Mary Lynn Henry and your co-author, Lynn Rogers. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. That was wonderful. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by NJIT, United Water, Meridian Health, Cone Resnick, Fedway Associates, the Fidelco Group, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. I started feeling this pressure in my chest. The doctors and the nurses that were attending to me, that they were of such excellence. They were wonderful. You know, they, they put my mind at ease. I owe my life to them. I, I, I don't think I really would be here if it was, wasn't for them. Because of the way they handled everything, um, I think that's really why I'm here. I felt that I was in good hands.